Vision Nerds, in this video today, we're gonna to be talking about cranial nerve number 10. Before we get jumping into this video, please, if you do so enjoy these videos, leave a comment down below and subscribe. I really enjoy reading all your comments. And also, if you really find all of this information helpful, you can go on over and check out nature.org. All of our notes and illustrations are available for you guys there. As we move forward through our neurology, we're gonna be talking about cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve, right? So with the vagus nerve, We've been going through every single one of these cranial nerves and we've been talking about what is their type, what's their assessment, what's the function of it, how do we know if this is for our patient, if it's working well, if it's not working well. And today, as we go through, we're gonna talk about the vagus nerve, cranial 10, and the type. The type is both. So when we say both, we're talking about cranial nerve being a sensory and being a motor. And you can see here this diagram, we got this diagram beautifully put here where the vagus nerve is coming out of the bottom of the skull and it is innervating this pink nerve all the way down through all of these different organs and it also plays a part in the back of the mouth and back of the throat. So for the function we have two, we have motor and we have sensory. For the motor, which I think is really, really cool, the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal is, they work together, they work in tandem, all right? So what does tandem mean? They're gonna work together, they're gonna work almost synonymously. So for function we have motor, and when I say that the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine, work together, it's because of the motor gag reflex. So the vagus nerve takes a part of the motor. What, is, what do I mean? When we elicit a gag stimulus, right, we're going to assess our patient, we're going to take a tongue depressor, we're going to get in there, we're going to press a little bit and elicit a gag. This occurs because when we elicit that stimulus, the afferent fibers on the glossopharyngeal nerve go to our medulla oblongata and they say something's happening, we need to gag. And the medulla oblongata says, okay, goes down the vagus nerve and the efferent fibers to that posterior portion of our mouth and causes that contraction of the muscles, that gag reflex, okay? So when we do assess our patients for the vagus, and we'll talk about a little more assessments later, one of them is going to be the, the gag reflex. The vagus nerve innervating the larynx and the pharynx and the areas in the posterior portion of the mouth is mostly where our motor and our gag reflex is. And then after that is all of our sensory. And we can see all of these different organs that are gonna be innervated and we're gonna to touch on them really quickly. But with the sympathetic and parasympathetic, we have different responses here. And with the different types of sensory within the vagus nerve, we have different types of responses. So for our sensory, I'm just gonna to quickly touch on different organs and what they do, just so we have an understanding of how this occurs within the vagus nerve. So for the sensory, we can see right here at the top, we have the heart. And then we also have our aorta, right? And within the cardiac system and within the vagus nerve, we have the heart rate, right? So we have heart rate that can be the rate and we also have the strength of the contraction. And then we also have blood pressure. So within our carotid right here, we have baroreceptors. Those baroreceptors are going to help tell us what our blood pressure is, which the vagus uh, nerve can also innervate. And then we also have negative ionotropic and negative chronotropic. Negative heart rate, right, bringing down the heart rate or bringing down a weaker contraction, okay? So the cardiac plays a part in the heart rate, contraction, and blood pressure. Then we also have the lungs, right? So we have the respirations. We have these bronchioles here. Within the vagus, there can be a constriction or bronchial constriction of that, which can bring down the depth of the breathing and the rate of the breathing. And therefore, that is how our vagus nerve works on our respiratory. Then we can also go into the GI. And this may look like a lot, and it's gonna sum it up really quickly with what I say next. The vasovagal response, if you've ever heard of that before, if not in nursing school, you're gonna hear this a lot and then if you ever work in the hospital, on the floor with the patients or in the ER, you're gonna get this story a lot. I don't know, they were on the toilet, all of a sudden they passed out. And that has to do with the vasovagal response. We see that this nerve is innervated all here in the GI. We see that the nerve takes care of different parts of the heart rate and the breathing rate. And if you think about it, when someone's on the toilet and they're bearing down, they're pushing really hard, they can elicit all these responses. Well, if they're pushing so hard, they're instantly starting to make that vagus nerve work because they're trying to open up the sphincter, they're trying to go to the bathroom, they can't. Because of that, all of a sudden, 
the vagus nerve says, oh, we got to drop our heart rate. We got to slow our breathing down. We got to drop our blood pressure. The person passes out, right? So with the vagus nerve, not only are we dealing with cardiac and we're dealing with respiratory, but we also are dealing with GI. A lot of enzymes and a lot of motility have to do with the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine. All that GI motility moving. There's also a portion of the large intestine, really the sphincter at the end that allows it to relax. So when we do open that sphincter up so we can go to the bathroom and pass our feces, that is also a portion of the vagus nerve. So GI motility and being able to have enzymes and things that are able to move this fecal material, this waste product through our system. Then we also have some different digestive enzymes that are coming out. We also have our pancreas. We have our spleen, helps with some immune responses. We have our liver that's going to help with some responses. And then we also have our kidney that's able to control our blood pressure a little bit as well and blood flow through the kidney. Just wrote down a little bit more here. We have our cardiac, respiratory, and GI, which we talked about the motility, the peristalsis, the movement, the digestion. Then we also have renal blood flow with the kidney, the spleen, which is our immune response, and then the pancreas, which also helps with insulin release. So as you can see here, lots of functioning that we have for the vagus nerve. And what happens when we want to assess it, right? We have the assessment here for the gag reflex. And then it's a lot of the same stuff as the glossopharyngeal as well. Is the patient able to swallow? Are they swallowing um, without any coughing, without any gagging? Is it a good, nice swallow? Do we see that little bit of movement when we ask them to open their mouth and say, ah? Uh, do we see the soft palate rise? And then do we also have any issues with our voice? Because we have that innervation with the larynx and pharynx, we have our voice box in here, right? And that's going to tell us if maybe there's something wrong with the nerve just when their voice is sounding different. So, we can assess these patients mostly on the gag reflex, okay? There can be other passive things the patient says. Maybe they're having issues with GI motility or there's something going on with their heart rate, it's dropping often, right? And that's something you can further investigate with that patient. But for the most part, to do the cranial nerve assessment and to just assess our patients quickly at the bedside, we're gonna be using the gag reflex, right? We're just going in there, use the tongue depressor and elicit a gag. If they have a gag reflex, great, if they don't, there are some other things we better quickly be moving on with, right? So if the patient fails, then what are some of the causes and risk factors? Well, this is a very plain, broad type of causes or uh, risk factors, right? Is there a tumor or some type of compression on the nerve? Is there some type of head injury or trauma to the nerve? Or is there anything else that's going on with the nerve itself? Some type of infection, inflammation that is occurring. And that is basic causes for what could be going on with the patient if we are assessing their cranial nerves and we have an issue with the gag reflex. And that is it, Ninja Nerds. That is the quickest overview that I can do for you on the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. I hope this video made sense. I hope you got something out of it. And as always, until next time.